Uh, I was, I went to a high school in the North Shore of Auckland and I was the first ever exchange student that my school had and uh, I think the principal cheated a little bit so I could be that. He gave me A's for everything and um, when I was, so I, I came over here as a twin exchange with the Rotary, Rotary Exchange or the Rotary Program and I was actually in New South Wales, a place called Wandandian. Anyone here heard of it? Really? They only had a pop population of 50 people. So I increased that. And um, I managed to get myself in the paper three times. Uh, I didn't break any law that I know of. Um, I, I was in there because I, I, I played football and I did a bit of athletics. And I was in the paper three times. So my name is Kim, K-I-M. On the first one, they called me Kina, K-I-N-A. The second one, they called me Ken, K-E-N, which I think that's what you think I'm saying. <laughs> and on the third one, they called me Kim with a Y. So I left Australia and I wasn't famous at all. <laughs> um, just as Dale said, obviously I'm here with the New Zealand Cross Whites. Uh, I head up an organisation called Soccer Plus NZ. I worked with an organisation which you also have over here in Australia. I don't know how familiar you'll be with them or even how they are here in Australia, but an, an organisation called OAC Ministries or Open Air Campaigners. And I worked with them for 15 years. It's very much an evangelistic outreach program where we would be out in the streets and run beach missions and all kinds of stuff for the purpose of sharing the gospel. And uh, it was while I was with them that uh, a friend of mine and I went over to, uh, uh, to the Czech Republic and Singapore on what we called a football mission. So something I'd never ever considered as a possibility. And, um, and from that, so 1998, uh, the, the friend of mine invited me. We sat down on the plane on the way back and we started planning for this organisation which we called Soccer Plus. The idea was this, is, is soccer was always a passion that I had as a kid growing up and, um, and I always played it every minute I got. And I realised that was something that I was good at. And I realised also then that surely our ministry has to involve the things that we're good at. Not to take those things away, but to find a way to use them with God. And so we, we formed this organisation and it's been a really, really exciting journey. So since 1998, um, so many other factors. So the New Zealand Crossroads idea, in fact, the came, first time I came over here for the tournament was 2007, but we never came up with the name of the New Zealand Cross Whites, which I'm sure you guys have figured it out. The All Whites are our national football team. And of course, we have that little, well, no, we have that major difference, which is the cross. And um, so that's how we came up with the name, the Cross Whites. But in a part of that, we, we you know, most years, except for the, during this COVID period, we would take missions teams overseas, uh, initially mainly to Asia, but now mainly to South America. And, uh, and the whole purpose of, of using football as a vehicle to share the gospel. Uh, I run a, a, an academy, I do a lot of coaching, I work with football clubs, with schools, I run a program in schools called Soccer for Life, where I'm sure you're similar here in Australia, where a lot of um, secular schools are close to, the, to religious education. So I go in there with a life schools program using, again, soccer as a vehicle, but biblical life schools. And I'm, I'm, and I'm able to get fairly close uh, with that in terms of what I'm able to, to share. And, uh, and it's about finding every possible vehicle and avenue that you can uh, to make that possible. And so I'm, I'm excited about where it's been. I was just sharing with some kids at, at a camp I was at last week that I, um, that if I, you know, my dream as a kid was to be a pro footballer. My second dream was to be an actor. My third, if that will fail, to be a teacher. And, um, and none of those three things eventuated, but if those things, any of those three had eventuated, I might not be what I'm doing, doing what I'm doing today. So I'm really grateful for where God has put me today for what I get to do. And, and a big part of my passion is giving other people opportunities. And so it's exciting that I get to do that. And it's a blessing for me. Uh, I never consider anything that I do to be hard work because I love it. Um, my mum was born in England. My dad was born in England. My oldest brother was born in England. My oldest sister was born in England. My next three sisters were born in New Zealand. My next three brothers were born in New Zealand. I was born in New Zealand. My youngest sister was born in New Zealand. Did you do the maths? I've got nine siblings, uh, four brothers and five sisters. Uh, I think what actually happened was my parents went to New Zealand in the 50s and they were given one mandate to increase the population. So. 
Um, <laughs> but I had a fantastic family uh, upbringing. I, you know, someone asked me the other day about when our family gets together. You know, there really rifts in it. There's no rifts in my family. It's just so good to be in a big family. When we get together, though, I say, be careful because uh, it's crazy. When we're together, the banter is crazy. Um, but I, I was fortunate in the family that I grew up in. When I, um, the other day, when Dale invited me to speak, probably about a couple of months ago, I think it was, to speak here, I tend to, when I get an invitation somewhere, I start praying and considering it from that moment on. That's what I feel the Lord's going to lay on my heart to share. And, um, and a- as it was happening, when I was flying over, I was given a real challenge as I was praying about this, flying of the plane and just considering this, about how I'm going to finish my message. And I just want to warn you, at the moment, I have two directions to go. One of those directions is deeply personal, and I have to decide if I feel I can go down that avenue. Uh, and the other one is, is less personal. So you'll find out which direction the Lord leads me when I get to the end of this message. Can I have the this, this slides, please? Okay. Um, there are three types of people in the world. Better switch this on so I can move it. All right. Or did I just switch it off? I did. Yeah, you're right. Okay, buttons. All right. Those who can count and those who can't. If you didn't get it, you're in trouble. All right. Actually, there's two types of people in the world. And I was looking at this list, and as I was looking through this list, you could make several lists, a lot more than I did. But I've come up with three lists. Those who believe and those who don't. And, uh, and it's simple. Jesus made that very clear. He said, if you're, you're either with me or you're against me, you're either... And, and, and uh, I'll open this up a little bit later, but believing in is not believing about. It's believing in. It's a depth to it. So we either believe in or we don't. And Jesus said, there's no middle ground. It's one or the other. And what that means is that if we don't believe, believe in by default, then we don't believe. There are those who build on rocks and those who build on sand. And I think you'll know the reference to that. And the third one is this, is there are those who know and those who don't. And, um, and again, there's a definition in that word know, which is really, really important. It's not knowledge, as we'll see. So first of all, there's those who believe and those who don't. Jesus said, truly, truly, I tell you, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment. Indeed, he has crossed over from death into life. There's a fairly new religion. Some people think it's been around for a long time, but it's a fairly new religion. It's not a religion that was even considered many, many years ago. It's called atheism. Most people believed in God, whether they understood who God was. We know about Paul who went into Greece and saw a statue to the unknown God. The people who believed and knew and understood that there was a God. And it's only been in recent years when this humanistic idea of atheism has come into it, where people would then say, maybe there is no God. But that was a ridiculous thing to say back in the day. Even if you didn't know who the true God was, you would believe in something. You'd look to the sun and say, maybe that is God, or to the moon and say, maybe that is God, or to the trees or whatever. But you believe that there was, in some sense, a God. And it made sense for that. The problem is when atheism came into into, uh, mode, people started thinking that way, then they could start considering the fact that there is no God. I was, when I was in my OAC days, I was in a place, there's a place called Aotea Centre in in the Auckland city, and I was, we would go in there and we we would put up sketchboards and share messages and, uh, and then we would um, engage with people and find opportunities to share with them. And I was, the university isn't far away from there, and I was speaking to a university student. And I was, as I was speaking to the student and sharing with them about the truth, this, this guy said, oh, I'm an atheist, oh, you know, there is no God. And I gave a few illustrations, and I realized not, none of these illustrations were working. He wasn't clicking to it. And then there was this moment of silence. And I was just sitting there, like this. And he was sitting there, he was looking this way. And I was thinking, Lord, I don't know what to say. And then I looked at my hand, and I saw my wedding ring. 
and I looked over to the guy and I said to him, I'm married. And he looked at me and, yeah, so what? I said, do you believe me? He said, why shouldn't I? Sure, well, you've never met my wife. And I said to him, do you know when I wake up in the morning, the first person I speak to is Jesus? Oh, you don't know that. And I said to him, this is the thing, that Jesus is real and I know he's real because I speak to him every day. And whether you believe that or not won't make a difference to me. Whether you believe I'm married or not won't make a difference to me. I'll still go home and there's my wife. And whether you believe I have a wife or not is irrelevant. And I want you to understand that I'm not talking about an idea. I'm talking about a person. And that's what makes it real. Over the many years when we've had this thing called atheism, something's crept into our understanding of science. I was talking with someone a little while ago about what science is. A young guy had said to me, I'd rather believe science than the Bible. And I said, do you know what the definition of science is? If you look in the dictionary, the word means knowledge. And so what science is, is knowledge. Now when science started to birth and, and many, many years ago and people had the scientific idea, their pursuit originally was truth. <coughs> That was the scientific pursuit, was truth. They were looking for truth. But in, in, in the last hundred or so years, science has changed from seeking truth to, to seeking, if you like, there could be a better word to use of this, but seeking justification for their ideas. So people are quite happy to go with a theory or even an hypothesis and chase it down as a truth instead of seeking for the actual truth. Because the danger that science has, if they seek truth, they'll find God. And so the problem is we want to be able to find truth without finding God. And so, and so a lot of ideas come. So for instance, we have an, a, 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 a thing called evolution, which we know is not even a theory, but actually an hypothesis. It's just an idea, not even a workable idea, but it's been persuaded to us as being a truth. But it doesn't fill the, the, all the criteria for truth. And, uh, but it suits the people who choose to believe it. When we think about belief, so when Jesus said that, uh, in, that we need to believe in him, when we think about belief, I want to look at it in two different ways. Belief, from our perspective, is not necessarily truth. Let me show you what I mean. If I stand here and I'm on, the, on a railway track, and I say to you, I don't believe in trains. I'm gonna find out very quickly that was a dumb belief. <laughs> truth is different than belief. Because when I stand on the track, the truth is soon gonna be revealed. And when people, when, when we use the excuse by saying, I don't believe and say, that's good enough for me. So when I sat there with that guy who was an atheist and he said, I don't believe, he was only justifying what he wanted, the life he wanted, by saying, I don't believe. And if I say, I don't believe, that's good enough. And in the world we live in today, what you believe, according to the world, is good enough. And truth no longer matters. You could even go into school and argue that two plus two does not equal four. And somebody would say, well, that's okay, that's what you believe. But it's not okay, because it's not true. And so we've stopped pers pursuing truth and instead pursuing what people want. And we chase our own desires and, and, our own, and our own ideas and thoughts because it suits our lifestyle, or it suits who we are, or it suits our environment, but it helps us not to pursue God because pursuing God then becomes dangerous for us. Belief in Jesus is different because as I said before, it's a belief in. So Jesus illustrated it for us in this way. He told a parable. And it was a foundational parable for everything. And I believe it's the foundational parable that will tell us who we are. Because if we get it, then we know who we are. The parable was, we, we term it the parable of the sower. And it was the parable when, he, when the sower went out to sow the seeds and the seeds fell on the path and some of the seeds fell on the rocks and some of the seeds fell amongst the thorns and some of the seeds fell on the good soil. When he finished explaining or saying that parable, by the way, you remember that his disciples didn't understand it and they wanted an explanation. 
And getting an explanation was the right thing for these guys, simply because they needed to get it. This was one that was important to understand, the foundational parable. And here's what it was, because when Jesus explained it, he said, when you hear God's word, it's, you're going to receive it in one of four different ways. You're going to receive it, and you're going to go, oh yeah, whatever. Or maybe, as, it, as you're receiving it, so maybe even to some of those people, when Jesus was, was sharing the parable, some of them were thinking about something else. It's not going to have any impact on you whatsoever. It's just going to disappear. The one that landed on the rocks, they are those people who go, I need to think about this. I need to consider this. This is serious. And let's use this environment where we are right now. Because obviously every Sunday and other days when people gather together to hear God's word, some walk out the door and forget what they heard. And that's the one on the rocks. They think about it. They consider it. But they walk out the door and then they remember life. The life they live. And forget what they heard. And then there are those who think they've got it. They think they understand it. Because they're in amongst others that they think they understand it as well. And they grow up with these who, yeah, I've got it. I think I've got it. I think I know it. But at some stage in their life, they see something they believe is better. Maybe it's fortune. Maybe it's fame. Maybe it's just another person. Maybe it's a lifestyle. But they see something and say, I want that. I don't want God. And they move away. But you see, they were growing up amongst the thorns, and at some stage the thorns were going to get them. And then there are those who grow up in the good soil, and it's firm, and it's everlasting. And they, those people produce a crop. As Jesus said, they will produce a crop, because what comes out of them is fruit. There's no fruit in any of the others. But there's fruit in this one, and they produce a crop. They influence other people's lives. They make a difference. Why? Because Christ is actually in them. Christ wasn't in the others. Christ is in them. And that's why the disciples needed to understand, you need to be the good soil. You need to be the ones that are producing a crop. You need to be the ones. And that's what believing in is. So when you meet people who say, oh, I used to go to church and I used to do that and I used to do this and I went to youth group and I went to Sunday school and I did all those things, didn't work for me, that's because Christ was not in you. You didn't quite get it. One of the things I love about the prodigal son story when people sort of share with me about people who walk away, I say there is a difference. When Jesus told the prodigal son story, that was somebody who was always coming back. We often have times when we wander away and we drift and we feel like we're not quite there and we're disconnected. But if we're in Christ, we come back. You know, when, when people challenge me in, in my faith and try to do it from a, from a, if you like it, in their sense, a logical sense, one thing they can never take away is the fact that he's in me. And that can never go. I can't walk away from him. And, and I'd say even if I wanted to, but I never want to. Because he implants in me the fact that he's always here, he's always going to be with me because he's made that promise. I will never leave you nor depart from you. I will always be with you. Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What he was saying was this, is that my whole sole purpose on life is Christ. In this lifetime, my sole purpose is Christ. Why? Because to die is gain. You know, one of the things that's impossible for us as human beings to define, um, and, and I think this, if we, the more we try to define it, the less we're going to make it. We're only going to know it when we get there, and that is what eternity is like. We're limited by our finite minds. We don't know how, how good it is. All I understand from it is if I take the best thing of all that I have in this life, it won't be good enough for heaven. Nowhere near good enough for heaven. And so when people think that heaven's going to be a boring place, they don't know God. Because God is not a boring God. The alternative, the alternative isn't even worth talking about because it's the absence of anything, anything good. And that's scary. There are those who build their house on the rocks and those who build their house on the sand. 
Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. If your pursuit in life is money, reputation, fame, um, whatever it is, understand this, none of those will be with you at the grave. None of them. And that's why Paul said those words too, by the way, for me to live as Christ, to die as King, because he realised anything other than Christ wasn't going with him. It was only what he had in Christ. And so when this, was, when this parable was shared, when Jesus talked about that, what he wanted people to understand is this, is that in our own way, we can make this life as good as we want. We can do whatever we want and enjoy it as much as we possibly want. But everything that we gain in this life, we don't take to the grave. It's not going to be with us. What will be with us is what we invest in Christ. That will be with us because God is the giver of eternal life. He's the only giver of eternal life. And because he's the only giver of eternal life, it means that what he gives is what lasts forever. And so when we pursue things that are of no heavenly worth, then we pursue things that aren't worth anything. I remember people who used to, there was a saying, it came out of a song actually, and it was a fairly popular saying, and I used to believe it, and then I thought more of it, thought it was wrong. And the saying was that for, for us to be uh, too heavenly minded to be no earthly good, and I started to realize, no, that's not what Paul says. He actually tells us to be heavenly minded, because when we're heavenly minded, then we understand how to be earthly good. So when our pursuit is for eternity, then what we achieve here on earth is all for God's glory and it's worth it. That's why I said to you, I'd give nothing if I had been up being a professional footballer or a famous actor or whatever. I dread the thought of that ever, ever happening because it might not have brought me to this place, to where God has me today. And serving Him is nothing better than serving Christ. Jesus lay for us an eternal foundation. So when we put a house on the rock, and the rocks, we know what the rocks are. The rocks are all those things that we pursue in this life to make us comfortable, to make us popular, to make us fun, whatever it is, anything, to make us feel better. And when we pursue, sorry, not the rocks, the sand. When we pursue those things and we put them, they're just sand. And when the storm comes, they get knocked over. And you, and you know in experiences, perhaps even in your own life, when things can just collapse and... I know, you know, of, of so many stories of people who have pursued financial gain and then something comes along and it all collapses and falls through and they have nothing. They have nothing because they put their insurance in something that was never going to last. And the truth is, even if it was going to last a lifetime, that's how long it was going to last. It wasn't going to last an eternal life. And so it was in the end worth nothing. And the greatest satisfaction found in this life is what we have in Christ and living for Him. And Jesus proved it. Because Jesus said for me to... Oh, sorry. Jesus, Jesus proved it because He went to the cross. And when He was challenged on two occasions that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, pre His baptism, when He was challenged pre His baptism, when He was in the wilderness, sorry, post-baptism, in the wilderness, and He walked through the wilderness and the devil challenged Him three times, Jesus said, no. It's not my purpose. You're trying to make me rich. You're trying to make me famous. You're trying to make me enjoy this world. This is not the world I'm going to be a part of. So I'm not going to take it. And the reason that, that I believe the baptism of Jesus, sorry, the, the temptations of Jesus were documented for us is because we face the same temptations all the time to be comfortable, to be safe, to enjoy this life. And he said, no, it's not worth it. At the end, I'm after that one. And Jesus' purpose was to give that life for us. His purpose was to die. The second time was with at Gethsemane before he went to the cross. And knowing in his human body the suffering and pain he was going to go through, knowing in a spiritual sense that he was going to be departed from his father. I tell you something, there are relationships that you think are too tough and they would hurt if they were broken. There's no relationship stronger than the one between the father and the son. No relationship that is that tight. And for that to be broken for that moment, we'd never understand the enormity of that sacrifice that Jesus made. Why? For us. 
we hadn't seen with it. But he believed we were because he was prepared to do it. Those who know and those who don't. Come you who are blessed. This is for those who are familiar with when Jesus told the parable of the sheep and the goats. Come you who are blessed by my Father and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That was because his, his, his word to those people was because I know you. The second group, he says, depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. His accusation to them was, I don't know who you are. When we stand before Jesus, there's only going to be one of two things. He's either going to say, I know you. Or he's going to say, who are you? It doesn't mean, and what I'm talking about there, that's why the word know is so important. It's not like from a head knowledge he doesn't know. He knows everybody. He knows everything. It's a heart knowledge. And he's saying, I don't know you because you chose not to know me. But I know you because you chose me. And at the end of the day, it's a very simple one for God. It's either I know you or I don't. And that's going to be no greater love, no greater love is there than one would lay down his life for his friends. When I, and, and so this is the this is the challenge part for me, and I feel that the Lord is dressing me to share this with you. In 1986, I got married. In 1988, I moved from the North Shore of Auckland to the West to West Auckland. A year later, my wife left. I had no understanding. I didn't know what was happening. I couldn't see any signs, any indications. I didn't know what was taking place. Unfortunately, I, as I share this to you, this is an all too familiar story. I didn't know what was happening. I remember one day, she, so what had happened was on a December, she said to me, uh, I'm going. She said, I'm going. And I said, I was dumbfounded. I couldn't see anything. I didn't understand. There were no indications. We were getting on fine. Everything was good. And then she said, I'm going. Then the next day she was gone. In January, one day, I was sitting out on my deck. My deck overlooked a, a park. And I sat on the deck, and I was just bawling my eyes out. And I was going, why? why? And I'll tell you one of the reasons I said why. I, I shared with you at the start about my family. One of my great dreams is growing up was I wanted to be a dad. Because I, I, I saw my parents, I saw my dad, and I saw how you know, my parents were born to have kids. And I thought, I look forward to the day that I'm going to be there. My theological understanding at that time was that you get one chance. I didn't see that you could ever have a second marriage. And when this had happened, I sat there and I thought, I'm never going to get to be a dad. And when that happened, I then, not long after, so I made a, I made a, a decision, and the decision was this, because I believe this is what Christ would do. In, in fact, this is what Christ does all the time with us. When we walk away, he chases us. And I believed that I needed to chase my wife. I would, ne I would never accept the fact that she died. I was going to chase her. And I never accepted there would ever be a divorce. I said, no, no, I'm going to do whatever, whatever I can. And it hurt because the, 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 what was happening on the other side was different. So I was getting stuff back that was hurting, but I was giving stuff that I believe Christ would give to me. And, I, and then further down the track, I, was, I used to run a home group and there was this girl in this home group that I felt, you know, the feeling. I feel when I'm around this person, there's a different feeling than I'm around everybody else. So I said to her one day, I said, can you stay behind after the home group and we'll have a chat? <laughs> and so she was there and I said to her, I said to her, And, and, and she said, yes. I said, that's a problem. Because I'm married. And I'm pursuing this marriage even though it's separated. I've been separated for a while. And I believed I would separate it until it either got together or divorce. And, um, and so I said to her, I can't make any plans for anything other than that. 
And it was clear that this marriage was going to end in divorce. Um, however, I said to her, look, we, we, so we never spent any time alone together. We never spent, we never, um, we made sure that we were always with other people when we were together and there would be no indication that there was anything happening because there wasn't. There wasn't, as far as I was concerned, there wasn't allowed to be. And then, um, two months before the divorce went through, and unfortunately, sadly, these days, divorces are pretty easy and it needs to be one side that agrees. And so all I had to do was witness it. But two, two months before that was going to happen, I said to, so this girl, her name is Angela, I said to Angela, I was at Bible college at the time and we would go, on the weekends you'd go home. And I said to her, I'm not going to go home this weekend because uh, that meant that I would go to church and I would see her church and all this. So I said, I'm going to um, stay in at Bible college this weekend and I'm going to spend the whole weekend seeking God. And I'm going to ask God. And, oh, sorry, I, I need to rewind a little bit in terms of the second chance. I asked the elders of my church, I said, I would like you to see from a theological perspective, if you believe I have a second chance of marriage, if you come up with a conclusion that's no, I will take it. I will study it as well, but I'm going to be a little bit biased. So I will, I will take whatever your conclusion is. And their conclusion back to me was they believed under the circumstances of what was happening that I had a second chance. So what I did is I, as I, um, as I said to Angela, we're not going to communicate at all this weekend. I'm going to just spend the whole weekend. And I will ring you at 8 o'clock on Sunday. And we will talk about what conclusion we come up with. Well, on the Saturday night, I was praying, really seeking God on this. And then I, I um, what happened was I heard, um, I really sensed that the Lord was saying to me, or giving to me the picture of Abraham and Isaac. If you know the story, Abraham um, walked up to the mountain with his son. God said, I want you to put him on the altar and I want you to sacrifice him. All Isaac and Abraham knew was he was about to take the life of his son. If you understand, if you don't understand that, understand this. This was his promised son. This was the, the, the one who would inherit Abraham's legacy. And he was told to put him on an altar and take his life. Abraham didn't argue with him. Because for him, what God said mattered. He took his son up to the altar like this. And I said to God, yeah, God, <laughs> I know what happens at the end of the story. I know what you're saying. I've got to put Angela on the altar, but I know what happens at the end of the story. It doesn't, he doesn't go to the altar. But I really sense what God was saying. Was, I want you to put the air in and let me take care of the rest. So what I did is I made a bargain with him. I said, here we go. I've got to ring Angela at 8 o'clock, but I'm not going to. If we're going to be together, then she will ring me. What a risk. <laughs> so I, I the, the next day came up and it was, I was watching, looking at your watch all the time. That's what I don't get one And guess what? So this is, in to, no, no, because I'm just going to go back to Courtney first. <laughs> when, um, so when, when Angela told me that she was pregnant, uh, that was, I don't think there's too many things I could score a hat-trick and a cup fine would be as good as that. And then when Courtney was born, she was stubborn, by the way. <laughs> 18 hour labour. And she had to go to epidural, and she's still stuck. Um, but when I, when, when, when I saw Courtney for the first time, it was thank you, Lord. And then he blessed us four years later with another daughter. But I see, I look at that and I go, this is what it's about. When I was going through the divorce period, I had moments when I had nothing. Nothing. I, I, my income didn't match my mortgage because when my wife and she was a nurse, when she'd gone, my, I was on full-time ministry. I was in full-time ministry, never reached the quota. Um, and I was, my mortgage was more than my income. And then I had other things on top. And there was this weekend, and I, I want to share this weekend with you, and then I want to conclude 
why this fits with this. My former wife had said to me, when she came out one day and she said, let's split up the house. And I said to her, you can have whatever you want. None of this is of any value to me, I want you. And she, and, and anyway, the only thing we negotiated on was either the microwave or the TV, and I said, you try cooking something in a TV. So I, I'll take the microwave, you can have the TV. And then when she came around one weekend to pick up all of her stuff, I decided I didn't want to be around that weekend, so I went up north, I had some friends up north that I went to stay with. And then when I, as I was coming home, I had, on Monday, bills of up to $2,600. I had one dollar. Nothing in my account. One dollar. was all I had. I was driving back down, and, and, I, and I was saying, what's the point? <laughs> what am I going back to? I've got nothing. And, and I wanted to just drive right past Auckland and just keep going, but of course common sense got the better of me. I, I went in, and with the one dollar that I had, I was able to buy a little wee carton of milk, so I could at least go home and have a cup of tea. But then, <laughs> I went to open the door and I dropped the milk. No, no point crying over spill milk. <laughs> I've saved rescued enough for a cup of tea. <laughs> went into the house. Um, I, I, we had a glass, used to have a glass door on the front and everything was gone. I went into the house, went into the kitchen and there were these two boxes sitting on the bench full of food. There was a, an envelope on the top, I opened up the envelope and inside the envelope was a cheque for $100. By the way, nobody knew my financial situation. I hadn't told anyone except the Lord. And, um, and then there was, a, there was a note from someone from our church, the pastor's wife, who said that, oh, this is from the church, it's just a gift we want to give you. We, we, we feel that maybe you could be struggling. I think they probably would have come out of the house on his way, obviously, to see that the cupboards were bare. So there was food there. I made a cup of tea, I put the milk away, and the fridge was full of food. I went down to the church, it was our church age year, I was running a ministry under the blanket of Youth for Christ and they had a policy that people separated couldn't run ministry. I had to give up that ministry running a program for teenage kids uh, that was going really, really well. And I, I went and slipped into the back of the church, tried to be inconspicuous, and when they gave the report on that, they were considering folding it because they didn't have the leadership. I sat there and thought, I've got no income, or very little income, I've got no wife, and now I've lost a part of the ministry that was important to me. I thought, couldn't get a whole lot worse than that. And then I tried to sneak out the back after the AGM, and then the pastor's wife came up to me, and she said, oh, did you, um, did, have you been home? And I said, yeah. And she said, did you see the food there? And I said, yeah, that's awesome. She said, did you open the freezer? I said, no. She said, oh, you need to open the freezer. And then, um, then she said, the church are going to give you $100 a week to help you out, because we, we believe you're probably struggling. And then I was trying to go and then a guy from the missions committee came up to me and said come I've got something for you and he gave me an envelope and I knew it was probably money so I left went home I actually forgot about it. made myself some dinner because I had food now made some dinner and I'd forgotten about the envelope and then a little bit later that night I was praying Lord how am I going to deal with this $2,600 that I owe and uh, I opened the envelope guess how much it was God is good. It's about knowing. The question I want to ask you is, do you know him? This is why I can never leave him. This is why I can never walk away from him. God is real. God is so real. And he needs to be real. And he needs to be impacting your life. And you need to be impacting the lives of others. God is real. Do you know him? Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for who you are. I want to thank you, Father, for the fact that you keep your promises. And your promise for us is that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us. And I thank you for that. You're a wonderful God. And I think that sometimes we don't realize how wonderful you are. I want to thank you for the dear people here. I want to thank you for this fellowship. I pray, Lord, that this fellowship will continue to grow with people who are rich in you, who are desiring to walk with you and are desiring to make you known. Father, we thank you for who you are.